Welcome, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us this afternoon, or if you're on the West Coast, I guess it's still this morning. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about, about online retailing, digital retailing, omnichannel. There are a bunch of names for it, but uh, as we take a look at, at this and, and incorporating it into our, our dealerships, there's a, there are a lot of questions that come up, and, and we're excited to kind of uh, flesh some of those out and talk about them as we go through this. So um, our presenter today is going to be Matt Weinberg. I'm going to introduce him in a second. He's with Drive Motors. But before we do, uh, with GoToWebinar, on the right-hand side, you'll have, a, you'll have a, a little dashboard panel, whatever you want to call it. Um, it has uh, little triangles that are drop-down menus. So each one of these gray horizontal bars can drop down. Um, B, uh, if you can all open the chat uh, drop-down, we're going to be having some questions and discussions going through the chat. Um, so I get that queued up. And also, uh, that's where you will throw in some Q&A uh, if, if there are some things that you want more clarification on as we go throughout the webinar around um, online retailing and, and incorporating and implementing that. So uh, just with that housekeeping stuff out of the way, uh, let me introduce you to Matt Weinberg. Um, uh, Matt. He's, he's kind of a big deal. He's the SVP of customer experience, consumer experience at Drive Motors. He's got 20 years of experience in automotive. Uh, a lot of this consulting 100 dealer groups, um, over 100 dealer groups on internet sales process and e-commerce. He's a trusted advisor for Ward's Auto Top 10 dealer groups, including Asbury, Group One, Penske, Larry Miller Flow, and Atlantic Auto Group. Um, and what we're going to do today is we're going to spend some time, uh, as I said before, talking about the five biggest challenge that uh, the challenges that impact online retailing, getting to the root of those, uh, explore some strategies dealers are using to overcome these challenges and talk a little bit about best practices that you can implement in your store. So uh, I think I've taken enough of your time, Matt. Uh, without further ado, uh, Matt, why don't you take it away? Awesome. Thanks for that great introduction, Bart. And I know Bart just kind of shared a little bit about my background, but I actually want to start this call by sharing that, you know, my name's Matt and I am a vendor in the automotive industry and I sell stuff to car dealers. I mean, this is what I do for a living. And I share that because I have a question for you as attendees, which is knowing that I'm a vendor and that I sell things to car dealers, how many of you that are car dealers or work at a car dealership are feeling really warm and fuzzy right now and feeling like you absolutely trust me 100%? And if anybody feels like that, please just go ahead and put in the chat box, yes. Now, last time I asked this question, nobody said yes. And it was a, with a live audience and nobody raised their hand, I guess is the way that I will phrase it. But I asked the question because I really think that this really sets up why online retailing and digital retailing is, it is and becoming even more significant in automotive retail. And that is the fact that we as a society are trained to trust no one, right? We don't trust anybody. We're skeptical. As soon as I tell you, and I'm a vendor and I sell things to car dealers, you're going, hey, wait, what's going on here, right? Who is this guy and can I trust him? And so you become skeptical real quick. And one of my favorite stories along these lines is, which I think I've shared on a past uh, driving sales webinar, but I think it's really significant, is a um, story of homeless people being monitored by, I always forget, I think it was 2020 or one of these other news shows, but they were looking at which homeless signs generated the most money. And so they were comparing different ones. I think one of them at the time uh, was, you know, a woman who had a sign that said, you know, my two kids and I are starving, please help, or something along those lines. And right on the same street was a gentleman with a sign that said, I cannot lie, I need money for weed. And he was the one that generated the most money of all of the homeless people that this show followed. And I think psychologically, it's really interesting to look at this because if you see a sign that says, hey, I'm a mother of two and I'm starving and I can't feed my kids, 
instinctively while we're like, man, I want to help. We also become skeptical and we're like, man, can we, tr can we trust that this is true? Whereas the homeless guy that's like, hey, look, I need money for weed. There's nothing to question. He's just being so brutally transparent. He's being so brutally honest that he's actually bringing those fears that we have as people that might give money to homeless that, oh, are they going to use this for drugs instead of food? He actually took away that. And even though he's saying I need it for drugs, he still raised the most money. So what does all this have to do with online retailing and automotive retail? Well, you're going to see as we go through the conversation today, I'm going to talk a lot about trust because it's the most important word in our industry. And for those of you that have heard me talk before, you've probably heard me talk about this. Trust is higher closing percentage and higher gross profit. And so in the automotive industry, this is what we need to do. So by the way, I should have actually, I actually should have started by saying, hey, you know, if, if you want, please type into the chat box, you know, what is your greatest concern when it comes to digital retailing or online retailing? Because I do want to make sure that I address those as we go through today's presentation. So feel free to type that in um, if you guys are, you know, have concerns and we'll try and address those. I may address some of your concerns as we go through anyway. But today I'm going to really share what I've learned over the last year and a half plus going across the country, dealer to dealer and working on digital retailing or online retailing. And so I'm going to kind of just share with you today, what are these big challenges that dealers are facing? How are they overcoming them? And what are some, some of them doing to actually overcome them by increasing profitability? And so real quick, if we can just kind of rewind a little bit as far as automotive retail goes. And Bart gave a nice introduction about me just to kind of elaborate a little bit. You know, I started selling cars on the floor at a dealership, really quickly got into the Internet department, was buying leads when they were faxed to us. They didn't even have an email address associated with them. And then a few years later, started doing websites and then digital marketing. And one thing I want to point out for you is if, if you're on this call and you're going, well, what's going on with online retailing? Do I need to really go down this path? Can I continue to sit on the sideline? Here's one thing that I can tell you in all my years of, of uh, automotive, um, in the automotive industry. I've never met a dealer that told me I started buying internet leads too soon. I've never met a dealer that said, I, I built my first dealer website too soon. And I've never met a dealer who said, I started doing digital marketing too soon. And I promise you, I'm never going to meet a de dealer in the future that says, I started doing online retailing or digital retailing too soon. Now is the time because it is just a small subsection of our industry. And, I'm not, and just to be clear, like digital retailing isn't really changing the way that we sell cars. The way we sell transportation has been the same for thousands of years. One of my mentors used to always tell this story. Some of you may have heard it if you've listened to me talk before, but about, you know, a camel salesperson. And he did the same thing. He did a meet and greet, a fact find, an inventory walk, right? He asked questions like, why are you looking for a new camel? Are you looking for, for a light colored or dark colored? One hump or two humps? Are you going all the way across the desert or just staying locally? And so I share this because I think one of the big fears that I've seen going across the country when it comes to digital retailing is change and that, oh, we're trying to change the steps to the sale. I don't believe that. The steps to the sale are the same. It's just how and where we're communicating them that is actually changing. And what I mean by that is our inventory walk and products presentation as an example. That's happening on our website. And so is our meet and greet and our fact finding. These things are happening online. And I think it's really important as dealers that we start to really look at what has changed in our economy and in our world. And the world that we live in today is what I call a click and mortar world, right? We used to have this brick and mortar world. There's also the new click world, if you will, or the internet, right? Amazon being the biggest example, of course. But especially for automotive, and not just in automotive, but especially for automotive, we are in this click and mortar world. I was at the supermarket today, and I saw three Instacart employees walking around my supermarket, by, you know, 
picking up groceries that they were getting ready to deliver to somebody. Um, and then I also see at the front of my grocery store, there's a pickup section now. And I think that pickup section is really, uh, you know, click list. If you're not familiar with click list, by the way, go check out click list. Uh, click list is where there's basically an app where I can do all my grocery shopping on my phone, pull into a parking spot, go on the app, say, this is the parking spot number I'm in and they'll come and they'll put it in my trunk. And this is that click and more, right? So this is what we're seeing out there. But I do want to point out Lowe's on the far right-hand side. Um, more than 60% of their orders are picked up at the store because what we're seeing is the larger the purchase, both size and monetarily, the more likely that it's picked up at a mortar or brick and mortar location. And so this is what's going to really apply to us more so in the automotive industry. It's going to be this click and mortar because, well, frankly, people are going to want to come in and see the car and pick up the car uh, most of the time. So when we think about this world where we've got this ability on our phone to just really quickly get almost anything that we want, right, this convenient world, if you will, that, that we're living in, how are you at your stores actually building trust, which we opened with? How are you building trust in the experience? How are you making it convenient and more trustworthy for your customers? And so when we think about this click and mortar world, one question that I want to ask, and if you can jump into the chat and, and either answer yes, no, or unsure, is can somebody buy a car online today? So if you guys can jump in and say yes, no, or unsure, I'll give you the results here in a second. So, and I think this is a really interesting conversation. I have a really, um, I'm going to ask another question in a second. And then I'm going to, I think I'm going to surprise you guys with my perspective on the answer to these questions. So it looks like um, roughly about, and it's, it's, almost, it's pretty evenly split. We're almost at a third, a third, and a third in terms of yes, no, or unsure. And I think that that's really interesting um, that a third of you actually say, I'm not sure. And I think it's, it's you're kind of spot on if you said I'm unsure. And so the next question, and then I'll address both of them is, can you complete a mark or can you complete or buy a mortgage online today? And so again, if you can jump into the chat and just say yes, no, or unsure. And as you're doing that, by the time I get to my point, here, you'll, you'll be complete, and I'll share the results from can you complete a mortgage online. But it actually doesn't matter whether you can buy a car online or not, and it doesn't matter whether you can complete a mortgage online or not. And here's why I say that, and just to share the data real quick on the mortgage, it looks like more of you think that you can do a mortgage online. So it was, it was just under 50%, it looks like, said, Yes, you can do a mortgage online. So more of you thought you could do a mortgage online than thought you could do a car online. And then it was pretty evenly split, split between no and unsure on the mortgage side. Um, but here's why I say it doesn't matter. But by the way, first of all, let's address, can you buy a car online today? Can you complete a mortgage online? The, the technical answer is no. Technically, you can't do either. Because there's going to be some forms that need to be signed in ink. But the reason why I ask this question, the reason why I think it's so relevant to our conversation today, and the reason why I tell you it doesn't matter, is because even though the answer is technically no, that hasn't stopped Rocket Mortgage and Quicken Loans from becoming the number one mortgage originator in the United States by telling everybody that you can. Because they're out there telling you that you can. And by the way, in many ways, they're delivering on that experience. So when I talk about how do you deliver, how are you delivering trust through your experience, I think Rocket Mortgage and Quicken Loans is an interesting one because they are telling everybody you can buy a mortgage online and they are convincing people that they did a mortgage online. And I have to admit that I am one of those people. Now I've done three Quicken Loans and I did the first one Gosh, it's probably four and a half years ago now. I've been saying four years for a little while, so I think it's probably probably around four and a half years plus. But for several years after I did it, I would have told you that I had done a mortgage completely online. Now, when I started to 
work with car dealers on selling cars online. And, and I'm not talking about 20 years ago when I was doing internet leads or, you know, 15 years ago when I was doing websites. I'm talking about here at Drive Motors working on digital retailing and online retailing. It dawned on me, I realized I didn't actually do a mortgage online. I thought I had, but really I signed everything in ink at the end. So I uploaded a bunch of documents. So I did a ton of it online. I did all the prep work, if you will, online, but I had to sign in ink. And so I just did it. I've done two more of those since then. Um, the most recent one uh, was earlier this week, by the way. So I just closed on a Quicken Loans on Monday. And again, almost everything was in ink in the end, but they make you feel like you did it online. And so in addition to Rocket Mortgage and Quicken Loans, you know, not caring that you can't actually do a mortgage online, but creating that perception, that image, that brand, if you will. Carvana is another example. Now, we could probably spend the entire hour talking about is Carvana going to be successful or not? They're losing money, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the bottom line is that it hasn't stopped them from passing most of the publicly traded groups in terms of used car sales. You heard that. I'll repeat that. They have passed most of the publicly traded groups in terms of used car sales in a short period of time because they are telling everybody you can buy a car online. Now, they show up with that car and a stack of paper. And this, again, is why I say it doesn't matter whether you can or not because you can create the perception. And frankly, it's what the customers want. So let's talk about the challenges, though, because there are challenges to doing this. There are challenges to, uh, first and foremost, in our first challenge here, getting the word out, right? Like, how do we, you know, can really share with customers that, hey, you can buy a car online? So, so awareness is one of the big challenges. And, and for the most part, this is going to really be around marketing, but there are some processes at the store that you can use to overcome this awareness challenge as well. So I'm curious, and again, if you can jump into chat and say yes or no to the following question. Do you offer digital retailing on your website today? Do you offer online retailing on your website today? So go ahead and put yes or no into the chat. I'm going to give you a second or two to go ahead and do that. And here's the interesting thing. Just like on can you buy a mortgage online, can you complete a mortgage online, I actually would suggest to you that I can take either side of this. Meaning, if you say to me, Matt, I don't, I don't offer digital retailing today, I will, I could actually argue that you do. And here's what I mean by that. I'm actually in the market to buy a car. I'm sure some of you are going to contact me, um, but my wife's lease is, is up next month, so I'm going through the car buying process right now. Um, by the way, I'm finding it more challenging than last time I bought a car three years ago. I think we're struggling as an industry to really provide. Uh, the right experience. That's just been my personal experience in, in this latest uh, shopping endeavor, if you will. But once I select a dealer, if they're not, you know, offering, if they're not using a DR tool, a digital retailing tool, I'm still going to try and do as much of it as I can online because they already have a trade-in valuation on their site. They already have a credit app on their site. They already have a payment calculator on their site. So while they may not be taking it all the way, if you will, uh, there's, they still have the pieces, or at least a majority of the pieces. And most of you probably use those, right? Meaning, if you have a customer that's coming from two or three hours away, or even an hour away, you're probably asking them before they come in, can you do me a favor, can you go on my website and complete a credit app? So you're using pieces of, the, of it now. And for those of you that say, yes, I do offer digital retailing, again, I could argue that, hey, technically you can't sell a car online today. But again, as I stated before, I'm not sure that that really matters. But what does matter is how do we create this awareness? How do we let our customers know that we offer online buying? And so a lot of this is just going to come back to marketing. And we're just seeing that dealers that market this have a lot more success. And here's the interesting thing about this. In many ways, online retailing is just a marketing play. Again, Quicken Loans and Rocket Mortgage is a perfect example of this. They become the number one originator of mortgages in the United States simply by marketing that, hey, stop dealing with everybody else. You can buy a mortgage online from us. 
And I mentioned the word brand earlier. I want to mention it again because brand as dealers, we like you know, we don't really do a great job, and I'm putting myself in here as well from my time on the retail side. We don't do a great job of branding. I think we're getting better as automotive retailers, but it's a struggle, right? We typically in our advertising, you know, unfortunately are focused on price. Some of us are moving away from that. Kudos to you if you are. But nine out of 10 car buyers say they're more likely to buy from a dealership that offers online checkout. So this is the right time for this marketing play, if you will. And maybe play is not the right word, but if you can build a brand like Quicken Loans did and like Carvana has done around the ability to, to buy a car online, you're going to separate yourself from everyone else. And even though we see nine out of 10 say they're more likely, look, we know the reality is that not that many people are doing it today. So we've kind of got this disconnect between everyone that says they will do it and those that do. So why do we have this disconnect? What's happening there? What is that disconnect? Well, it's a few things. One is how do car buyers feel about car dealers? And I get a lot of answers to that, but the suspect, by the way, is my favorite answer. But the bottom line is it all points back to fear because they don't trust car dealers. They're concerned. They're worried they're not going to get a good deal. And all of this actually leads to fear. And so, even though when you ask me, hey, would you be more likely to buy from a dealership that offers online checkout? Of course I say, yes, I'm comparing you to ClickList and Instacart and Amazon Prime. But now I'm on your website and I'm like, crap, if I fill this out, do I own this car? It's a big purchase. I start to become uncomfortable and that visceral emotional response of fear starts to kick in. So this, we can view this gap between all these people that say they would prefer to buy from dealership that offers this and the amount that do as an opportunity. And it's a marketing opportunity, right? So we need to optimize our website and our marketing to build this trust. Because again, they have a fear of us. My guess is most of you on this call, occasionally, if not more often, will sometimes ask a vendor a question that you already know the answer to just to see what they're going to say, to keep them honest, if you will. What does that have to do with our conversation? Well, if you don't think that car buyers are doing that with car dealers, you're absolutely wrong. We know that car buyers today go into somewhere around two stores, by the way, 1.3, 1.6. Uh, I have never found a study that says that. I see lots of references to it. Um, I've seen two recent studies. One says 2.1. I think the other said 2.4. One is Urban Science, which is very trusted source. The other was Google. Um, so it's it's two or so. But bottom line is they don't walk to, into the four or five stores they walked into when I started in the industry. And so what this means is they're trying to figure out in their process, well, which store or two stores or maybe three stores am I going to walk into? And in order for them to do that, it's actually easier for them to cross stores off the list, right? In other words, they're going to ask questions and see how are you responding? How transparent are you being? And some of those questions may be via email. They may be via form submission on your website. But I want you to start thinking about it. Everything that you do, whether it's marketing or how you're communicating with customers, whether it's, you know, phone ups whether it's via email, whether it's through mass email campaigns or, uh, you know, through text and video, your messaging should always be keeping in mind that this customer is trying to cross me off the list because they're only going to go to a couple of stores. So we need to optimize and keep building trust by making them understand that we sell cars differently here. I call it the three T's. I know Bart's heard me talk about this before. I call it the three T's. When we talk about marketing, focus on transforming the car buying process. Focus on time. We're going to talk more about that in a second. And focus on transparency. Which, by the way, transparent pricing is the number one reason that car buyers say that they chose one dealer over another. So don't let them cross you off. Build trust in everything that you do.
So awareness was challenge one. Challenge two is speed. And really, like, I mean, this is not a new challenge, right? <laughs> this is the number one complaint that car buyers have about the car buying process. It's how long it takes. And so this is a multifaceted challenge when we talk about online retailing. The reason why I say that is just in general, as an industry, we need to work on how quickly we sell a car. We need to make it faster, right? There's a dealer group in Denver that is marketing one hour, uh, one person. Mm, I forgot the other thing. It's one hour, one person, one something else. And I forget. That's okay. But point is, is they're focused on speed. So this is really, really important. And if you can actually leverage online retailing and, and have a faster process, what we see is a huge increase in CSI. And so this is really, really important. And there's a study that some of you have probably seen that 83% of customers, after they bought a car, said, I, next time I want to do more online. Next time I want to do more online. Why are they saying that? They're saying it because they spent too dang long at the dealership. And online retailing can help change this because if I have a phone up or an internet lead and they're coming in, you know, tomorrow at 2 p.m. or whenever it is, and whether they they live in my city or they're coming from an hour away, how do I make sure I have everything ready? So online retailing, because it allows the customer to do things like upload an image of their driver's license, upload an image of their insurance card. See, that's where Quicken Loans understood how they could increase the speed, make this easier, right? That's where they started allowing uploading of gifts and things like that. So we as an industry will continue to round this out, but because the customers want to do it online, they want to do it because they want to do speed. And so the two facets of speed are one, we just need to figure out how do we speed up the car buying process, but the solution to that and the answer to it is by leveraging online retailing tools because this is going to offer a simpler, faster process. And speed means trust. And here's what I mean by that. One of the um, biggest concerns that one of you chatted about and put in the chat box was F&I process. And that's a great one. But here's the thing. In many ways, online retailing is about speed to f and I. And when I say speed to F&I, I mean speed to either the F&I process or speed to the F&I office. And here's why that's so important. If I'm a customer and I've been in your store two, three, four hours, when I get into the F&I office, what's my mental outlook? How am I feeling psychologically as the customer? What's my body language look like? I'm exhausted. I'm just, I just want to sign and have you give me the key so I can go home. I'm exhausted. But if you get me in the F&I office in 30 minutes or less or 45 minutes or less, what is my mental outlook? Well, how am I feeling? I'm absolutely going, hey, totally. Tell me more about how I protect my investment. I just spent $30,000 on a car or 40 or 50 or 70. Yeah, tell me more about how I protect that investment. The other thing that I think is really interesting and I think we're going to see a shift in the next couple of years, is, you know, how are we handling phone ups and internet leads? And again, I'm going through this right now. I talked to a dealer yesterday. I'm trying to get a, a lease quote. And what's the first thing that he says to me? Well, have you driven the car? When can you come in and drive it? Now, I was saying this in 1995. Like that was what I was using 25 years ago. As the customer, when I'm asking him for a lease quote, and he's saying, well, have you test driven it? To me, I'm going, what does one have to do with the other? I don't even want to test drive it until I know if I can afford it. That's their mindset. You have to put your consumer hat on. And then I talked to a friend of mine who I've known for years. He works for a dealership several states away, but I told you know, I was telling him my story. He's a good friend of mine. And he said, and he's not, by the way, he's not even in sales. He's in digital marketing. He's a you know, VP of digital marketing and a group that owns over 20 something stores. And he says to me, well, what car are you looking for? I tell him, 
And I actually tell him, because I looked, I'm like, hey, you have, this is, here's the bin that you have at one of your, you know, five dealerships that sells the, this particular brand. And I said, look, I'm shopping a few stores. I'm like, you're welcome to take a look and see. And he goes, well, what's the best price you got? And, and I'm like, what is that? Why are you asking me that? What does that have to do with what the best price you can sell me the car? He's like, well, I'm trying to beat it. I'm like, tell me your best price. I'll tell you if I have a lower one. It's my friend. And I'm still sitting here going, come on, man. And so, again, I share this because most dealers' strategies today are actually confirming to the customer that you are a typical car dealer. When you are saying things like, have you test driven it? Price doesn't matter. We've never lost a deal over price. <clears throat> if you're saying things like, in order to give you the most for your trade, you need to come. They heard that the last five times they bought a car or more. Now imagine if instead you make it a simpler process and instead you say things like, hey, how many car, how many car dealers did you talk to today that, that answered if you've already done a test drive and tried to talk to him for a test drive? Make fun of the car buying process and tell them, hey, we do it differently here. We're transforming the car buying process. We're saving you time and we're more transparent. Did you know that you can do the whole thing online and then come in and make sure that you're happy with the car if you haven't already test driven it? And then at the end, you can say, have you, by the way, have you test driven it? But if you just open with have you test driven, you're test driven, you're just sounding like every other dealer. And we want to separate ourselves. And this is where follow up comes in, right? What does the follow up look like? Every buyer's journey is unique. So we need to make it more flexible. How and when and where do they want to start the buying process? Do they want to start with, what their trade is worth sometimes because sometimes they're worried they're upside down do they want to just start with a test drive so we've got different you know different people are looking for different experiences and let me give you an example of someone that's doing this right and you maybe you'll laugh at first but mcdonald's what can we learn as car dealers from mcdonald's or chick-fil-a I like, I like to talk about McDonald's because I can buy a, a McDonald's hamburger one of five ways. I can now get it delivered if I want. I can buy it through the app and pick it up. I can buy it at the counter. I can buy it at the drive through I can buy it at the kiosk. So why is McDonald's offering five different ways to buy a 99 cent hamburger? It's because different people want to buy in different ways. <clears throat> and they want to be there for all of those people. They want to be the burger of choice for everybody because they remove friction from the process. They make it really easy for customers to buy the way that they want to buy. And again, nine out of 10, now I'm more likely to buy from a dealership that offers online checkout. So even if they're not ready to do the whole process online because of fear and because 73% want to touch, see, smell, feel, you know, that car before they actually finalize a purchase. But we need to remove the friction from the process. We need to stop sounding like the typical car dealer and using the same lines and tactics that we've used forever. Oops. By the way, um, one of... Sorry, I got... I, I got distracted. I have ADHD like some of you car people out there, so I got distracted. Um, so we need to start changing the way, like I said, that we talk to our customers and communicate with our customers. And we need to personalize our follow-up. And this is how we're going to build trust. So a lot of dealers are of the mindset that, hey, I need to get as many leads as I possibly can. But how are these leads being handled? What does that look like? I've walked into 10 stores in the last two months, like I said, in my car shopping experience, and six of those stores have never called me. I've given them my business cards. I've never gotten a phone call or an email. So personalize that follow-up. This is going to help build trust. And this brings us to challenge four, which is culture. This may be the biggest challenge that we're facing in our industry. And there's a lot. We could probably do an entire presentation just on this topic. Um, so I'm going to try and Reader's Digest version it 
uh, for those of you that are old enough to know what Reader's Digest is, I think I just dated myself. But culture is an issue, right? We see employee turnovers costing dealers a huge amount of money every single year. I know in 2017, 72% of salespeople that started a deal from January 1st were not there on December 31st. And last year it went up. I, I, I can't remember if it went up to 73% or 74%. The bottom line is it went up. So we've got this huge issue across our industry. Why is this happening? Why can't we retain salespeople at our dealership? I think there's a few reasons. I think one of, one of the challenges is that we as dealers are asking these salespeople to do and say things that they shouldn't, that, that they don't want to say or do, right? So their mindset is, wait, you want me to tell this customer what? And so we need to make a shift there. As far as millennials go, most dealers I talk to are having trouble keeping millennials because they don't like the process any more than the customers do, right? They're struggling with the current car buying process as it exists today. So, we need to kind of look at this shift and look at how is culture changing. And by the way, one of the interesting topics around this, which most dealers probably don't want to talk about, is our pay plans. And again, we could probably do a whole presentation and a whole hour conversation on pay plans. But we've talked about the consumer experience, right? Less than half of 1% of car buyers like the current car buying process. Well, we are in an adversarial position as car people with the car buyers. So if I own a dealership, I shouldn't really be wondering, well, why do people not like the car buying process when, I, when everybody that is consumer facing gets paid based on how much money they make off of the customer. This is what companies like CarMax have figured out. By the way, AutoNation, just to... Um, you know, add to this, AutoNation offered, offered their salespeople, excuse me, the opportunity to change their pay plan to a flat pay plan or stay on commission, and more than half chose the flat pay plan. Now, I've had some dealers say to me, well, I don't want those people on my team. And I don't know if I agree. If somebody's mindset is, hey, look, I want to make a fair living and I want to provide a good experience to the consumer. Uh, to me, that's not a bad thing. And I think that CarMax has proven that you can actually make more money off of the customer if you do that. Right? So I already talked about millennials. Um, I forgot I had that slide in there. So we want to transform our culture and build trust. And again, this comes back to trust. I had a really interesting conversation. I was just at a conference. And I spoke to somebody who I used to work with. He now works at an ad agency. And I asked him, hey, what are you telling your dealers about online retailing, digital retailing? And he said to me, he goes, I'm telling them to run. I'm telling them to avoid it. And I said, really, why are you telling them that? And we had a pretty long conversation about this. And his basic argument was dealers aren't ready for it. They have to get their act together first. They have to change their process. They need to get better at everything that they're doing. And it's funny because at the end of our conversation, he actually wound up saying, you know what, Matt, you're right. Now he did have buyer's remorse and accepting uh, defeat, I will call it, in this uh, bout of intense fellowship, as my wife likes to call an argument. She calls it intense fellowship. Um, a few days later, uh, he actually texted me. I changed my mind again. So we had buyer's remorse on, on accepting defeat in this conversation. But what I share with him, I said, I said, I don't understand. I said, if car buyers are struggling with their processes, we've been telling them for years that they need to improve that. Have they? Like, are they actually doing it? No, because the turnover is so intense that I don't have time to train people because they're not even here long enough. 72% are gone after one year. So dealers put less money into training than they used to because the people that they train leave. 
And so this culture problem isn't going to go away before we start to actually, uh, and the process challenges aren't going to go away until we start to fix them. And part of that is, has to be the way in which we're communicating and selling cars. And so when I said to him, hey, if you don't give them the tools to change it, then how are they going to do it? That's where he was like, that's a really good point. And so I think that we need to look at transforming our culture as a means of building trust with our customers. But part of this has to be shifting, again, not necessarily the steps to the sale, but where some of them are happening. And again, if you can imagine, if I call two dealerships and I ask for lease quotes from two stores for the same vehicle, and one of them tells me, hey, we're changing the car buying process here. We're completely transparent. Here's my price. And by the way, when you come in, it's only going to take you an hour to buy the car because I'm going to have you do a lot of it online. Who am I more likely to buy the car from? Of course, I'm going to do it for the one that makes it more convenient for me. So we need to transform our culture because that's the only way that we're going to build trust and shift away from this adversarial scenario that we've been facing forever as an industry. So challenge five is pricing. So, oh my gosh, again, we could, there's a lot that we could unpack here. But I want to point out, you know, most dealers' mindset is one of the biggest concerns as far as digital retailing is, what about my pricing? I want to protect my pricing. I want to protect my pricing. Well, a couple of things. One, to a dealer that says to me, well, won't people be able to see my price? Well, are, are you on TrueCar and Cars.com and Car Gurus? Do you respond to people who ask for a price via email or who call you and ask for a price? I mean, let's face it, your price is out there, right? Your price is really already out there. And so we have a choice. We can keep focusing on protecting our price and being adversarial to the consumer and the experience that they want because we're trying to protect a few dollars. But in reality, consumers look at low price and a transparent price is being the same. So a transparent fair price in the consumer's mind is the same as a low price. And in fact, the number one reason that car buyers say they chose one dealership over another is transparent pricing. So we're going through all of this effort to hide our pricing, and every time we do it, the customer's going, oh, okay, so you're a typical car dealer. I trust you less now than I did a second ago. You're not building trust. You're, you're, you're exacerbating their fear. When you try to hide it, they're going, okay, I can't trust you. That's just the reality, whether we like it or not. But here's what's amazing. And actually, Jared Hamilton, CEO of Driving Sales, shared this with me. He shared that there was a university that did a study. He shared this at NADA. And they broke customers into three categories. And the first third, they gave the invoice to this customer as soon as they walked in the door. The second third, they give the invoice to the vehicle right at the test drive. And the third group, they gave the invoice when the customer received their first pencil. And guess what? The customer that received the invoice earliest when they walked in the door, paid the most for the car. And the customer that got the invoice last at the first pencil paid the least for the car. So when you're transparent, the sooner that you're transparent, the more gross profit you're typically making. By the way, I, I meant to mention this earlier, but we talked about F&I profit and, and we talk about front end profit. We talk about F&I being a fear. Someone put that in there. So we're in, um, almost all of Asbury and we are in um, probably about, you know, probably about 40% of group one and we're rolling out most of group one as we speak. And, and what they're sharing with us is, and I won't share which is which, but one of them is telling us that they see a $700 increase in gross profit when someone goes through the online process. And most of that is F and I, most of it's on the back. And the other one is telling us they're seeing a four to $500 lift. And again, that, this one, they're saying 50 to 100 is front end. 
and the rest is back end. So they're seeing an increase in, in front end uh, and they're seeing an even bigger increase in back end. And it's because they're being transparent with the customers. And so this is what we're seeing. Um, we have some stores that are as high as 785 increase by being transparent and letting the customer go through the process. And here's the thing that's interesting. If I get a customer on the phone, I'm in a BDC or I'm an internet person or I'm a desk manager and I took a phone up. I don't care who it is, but I've got a customer on the phone and I'm trying to talk them into my store along with every other dealership that they talk to. Right? When can you come in? When can you come in? When can you come in? They know that you have an ulterior motive to that. As opposed to what I shared before, which is, hey, do you know you can do this online? Well, here's what's really interesting, ladies and gentlemen. The more you get them to do online, the more committed they become to your car and your dealership. And let me repeat that. The more you get them to do online on your website, the more committed they become to your car and your dealership. So start pushing people through the process on your website. Because the more they do on your website, the more likely they come in. And I'm not just saying that as a feeling. I have a store who when someone goes all the way through online checkout, they are closing over 70% of those customers. So you better believe that they continue to try and push more and more people through that process. Because it increases their closing percentage and it's increasing their gross profit. So price is really critical. This builds trust. And by the way, uh, just one company that I want to point out, True Car. When we look at the customer base, what True Car has figured out is they've figured out to focus on 80% of the customers. And here's what I mean. I've done a lot of internet sales process training over the years. So I've trained like Penske stores and Sonic stores. And I've always done a lot of role play. And when we would do role play, we would talk about the 20 percenters. There's 20 percent of customers that are just going to grind you. They're going to beat the crap out of you. They're going to steal your lunch money. And then they're going to come back the next day. And they're going to tell you there's a scratch on the car. And you're going to look and you're going to go, I don't see a scratch. I don't know what this person's talking about. They're crazy. And then they're going to give you bad CSI, right? So the 20 percent are the grinders. Those are the people that are just going to, you know, really grind you down. And part of it is because that's just, that's just how they are. I used to tell my, my wife, the more the customer pays me, the happier they are. She never understood it. Um, but what, tr what True Car realized is, look, 70% just don't want to pay more than their neighbor. 10% are lay downs. That's the number we used to use. It's less than that now, right? It's probably 4%, maybe even less than that. Um, but that 80%, they just don't want to get screwed. They know that you're not the Red Cross. They know that you're not the library. They just don't want to get screwed. So True Car is focused on that. Everything they do is about transparency. Because transparency works. Look at Southwest and their transparent, transparency. How successful has that been? That actually let Southwest go from a discount airline to a full price airline. For those of you that fly Southwest, you know what I'm talking about. Southwest used to be really cheap. It's not cheap anymore. It costs the same as every other airline. But they've created a feeling around their brand, right? And a brand is a feeling. And transparency and trust needs to be at the heart of it as you move forward. Because the bottom line is trust is everything. Without trust, you've got nothing. You certainly don't have a car deal. So trust is everything. And it saves time. So you notice there's a lot of T words. I love T words. Trust, time, transparency. And again, it increases gross profit. So trust is really the key when it comes to online retailing. This is what it's all about. How many of you have an Amazon Prime account? And how many of you actually price check Amazon? You don't because you feel like it's a low, fair price. It's not necessarily the lowest price, but you trust them. You trust the experience that they're going to give you. And that's what we're going after here, ladies and gentlemen. And it's going to take a buying cycle or two as we go through this. But if you start to think of your brand as a feeling and how do you want people to feel 
about your dealership and your brand. These are the steps that you need to take. You need to optimize your website and marketing to talk about the ability to buy online. You need to offer a flexible process so that the customer can enter when and where they want. Personalize your follow-up. Again, start telling people you can buy on. Did you know you can buy online at our dealership? Transform your culture. We need to change the attitudes at our dealership. And that's a lot harder to, to do than say, right? Um, it's a challenge. But become the champion. If you're a, whether you're a GSM or a GM or a dealer principal or an internet manager or BDC manager on this call, become the champion because we are going to get there as an industry. Be, I shared in my last driving sales webinar that we as employees in this industry have a career decision to make right now. Are we going to resist this upcoming change or are we going to become the champion at our dealership? And that will position you much better because this is where we are headed. And if you become an expert in it today, you're going to be way better off. I also will point out it's going to be easier to transform culture a little bit at a time. Now, if you're at a dealership where you think you can do a wholesale culture change, by all means, do it. But that's probably 5% of stores. Most stores are going to have to do this slowly. But it's just another reason why you need to start now when this is a small percent of the business. If you try and do it when it's 40, you're going to trip over yourself. And then again, transparent pricing. And I know this is a tough one for people to swallow. That's why I share that study that Jared Hamilton shared with me and the fact that the number one reason that car buyers say they chose one dealership over another is pricing transparency. And so again, it all comes back to trust. So what questions are out there? Feel free to jump into the chat box and enter any question. Um, Bart, I think you've probably been monitoring along the way. So um, if you want to share some of the questions that we've received and as we receive them, I'm happy to jump in and answer as many as I can, as best as I can. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matt. And um, yeah, feel free to do that. Um, and, and as we get going, uh, uh, I've got a few questions that I that I like to pose and then we can get into uh, some of the people in the chat. But uh, get away from the fact that you guys have. Um, sorry about that. I'm not not taking away the you guys have some some really sexy technology um not taking away from that at all but i'm hearing a recurring theme on what you're saying um correct me if i'm wrong here but most dealers regardless if they if they define it as such they have some form of digital retailing and regardless if you if you if you go all in with with online checkout or, or you're just dabbling, there are some fundamental ways you need to approach the car buying process. Um, and, and in fact, if you approach those things correctly, those five things, um, you're setting yourself up for when when you do make that transformation, it, it's a smoother one. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, I think it's fair to say. And I think uh, for those of you that have not looked at this there's something called challenger selling. There's a book about this and the readers digest or nuts and bolts of it is that you have to bring out people's fears. You need to address them in order to overcome them. Right? So we know that people have a fear of car dealers. And so you can leverage, yes, you can leverage your existing technology by saying, Hey, did you know that we can do much, most of this online? I'm sure that you have concerns about, you know, how dealers treat you, that they're just trying to talk you in and take advantage of you. Here we do it differently. Let me tell you about our process. And so, yes, you could use what's on your site. Now, I would obviously recommend that you get a tool, whether it's Drive Mode or somebody else, that is, is more streamlined. But even as you look at those, again, this comes down to convenience. The only thing that we as human beings care more about then money is our time. And so we have to be convenient. And so 
you know, 7-Eleven, just as a quick example, right? It's a convenience store, you know? So like 7-Eleven understood the human condition long before any of us did. I mean, think about 7-Eleven and how big it is today. And they started being open from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. because it was convenient for people. And so they created this whole convenience market. I mean, we've taken it to, you know, many decades later, we've taken it to a whole new level, right? But it, everything comes back to convenience. So even as you look at these tools, you may, as a car person, look at a digital retailing tool and be like, oh, this looks simple. Take, you know, take that tool and have somebody that you know that's not in the industry look at it. Have some people that are not in the industry compare some of these digital retailing tools and which one is easier, which one's more convenient. I share that because, like, for example, there's a tool that has taken the 10 or 12 steps to sale and reduced it to six. As a car guy, when I first saw that, I was like, wow, <laughs> that's really concise and really simple. But then as I put my consumer hat on, I'm like, wait a second. I want the easy button, right? Like, I want to do things in one step, maybe two, three, if you're lucky, right? So, yes, technology is just a piece of this. Um, but at the end of the day, this has to be so easy. You have to just make this easier for the customer and think about how do I build trust and convenience. You're you're bringing up another another great point, and 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 I think that everybody that's on this webinar has experienced broken uh, online checkout, online retailing. Um, you know, for whether it be I, I tried to buy something with a big box store, or I went to pick it up and I had to jump through the hoops and go through the line like everybody else, or whatever it is. But it, if you're going to set this up. You know, you really have to pay attention to and make sure that you can deliver on that experience. That's almost that's almost paramount. It is. And but here's the thing. So this is a really interesting topic that I like. And again, it's another topic that we could probably do a whole hour. Um, so I think that there's two sides to this coin. One side, which you're pointing out, and I I agree, is. Hey, look, if we're creating a brand and a feeling, then we dang well better be ready to deliver on it, right? Because otherwise we can actually do more damage to our brand and to our dealership, right? I agree with that statement, but here's the thing. If you sit there and say, okay, so I'm going to take the next three to six months to make changes at my dealership and try and, you know, prep myself for this. Right. Well, during that time, more and more people are going to be buying cars online. So there is a roadmap for this. And that's why, I, like, my perspective would be today it's okay to start doing this because while 9 out of 10 say I'm more likely to buy from a dealership's office online checkout, most aren't going to use it yet. So you're going to get the marketing value, right? You're not going to get crossed off the list, if you will, as I shared earlier, but only a few are going to use it. So you really only need one, two, three, or four competent people, depending on the size of your store, to right. pull this off because it's so small. And the roadmap that I mentioned earlier is internet, the internet leads, right? I remember in the mid and late 90s when these leads were first coming in, I, I handled them by myself. I was in the corner of the store waiting for those leads to come. I didn't need everybody else at the store to be on board. I was able to take that customer through that process. So you only need a handful of people. Now there are other obstacles that can happen. Meaning if I'm in, if I'm a BDC manager or internet manager on this call, and I'm going, Oh great. I can do that. Now look, if you don't have the ability, you know, to prevent the desk manager from trying to re desk that customer when they come in, then yeah, you're going to have a problem. Right? Um, right. But as long as you'll be allowed to, you know, get the customer into the F and I office as quickly as possible, you should be fine, but that won't be true in a year or two. In a year or two, we're going to see more and more people doing this. And by the way, the person that goes through this is the person that's going to tell all their friends and family about it. So these are the influencers right now that are going through it. So these are the people that you want because they're the ones that are going to get on social media and go to the water cooler and go to the country club and go to the family dinner. Maybe they have Passover on Friday night, you know, tomorrow. And they're going to tell everybody at Passover, I bought the car 
I bought the car completely online, even if they didn't. So, so yes, I agree with this concept that, hey, we need to make sure we deliver it, but it doesn't take a whole lot to do that. I can do it with one or two people that are champions in my store. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally makes sense. And I think it's it's a great it's a that's some great advice for people who who, you know, I mean, are at the edge of the diving board and they're and they they know they need to do it and they and they want to jump in, but maybe they're waiting for for some dominoes to fall inside of their organization um to make it make sense. It's just get that small team, um get get those get those just get those trailblazers and jump in um and make it happen. The, the, the last question I have, and, and it's more of a, a comment, and guys, if, if you're on the webinar and you haven't seen Carvana's website, go to it. It will inspire or maybe depress you. Um, the, <laughs> whole, the whole homepage, to your point, Matt, it's not calls to distraction. It, it's on one thing. It's car buying doesn't have to suck. And if you look at all of the value props, uh, it, it's it's all about online checkout. The reason I bring that up is I I feel like that you know we all struggle with with branding right now, um, setting ourselves apart. You know the OEM has so many mandates and constraints, and cars are all so good, and there's almost competition everywhere. Um, this is a really good opportunity to to get some branding horsepower if you if you're able to communicate it right. Agreed. There's no question about it. And yeah, I mean, Carvana is a great place for you to look. Um, and there's a lot of dealers out there that are getting down this path. And I can tell you, I mean, we're talking to a lot more who are who are looking at this and figuring out how do we do this. All the large groups, all the progressive groups are all either already doing it or well down the path of, all right, how do we execute? How do we roll this out across our stores? Um, so time is limited too, I think, when it comes to, um, you know, this brand grab, if you will, right? Because if you if you wait until every other store in your market is is marketing the value of online buying, then there's no value left for you to grab onto. Right. Right. Uh, it was great points, great points. Thank thank you for this. Uh, the people, everybody that's on the webinar, we will get this recording out so that you will be able to access it. If you miss some slides or, or, or anything, and you can see that Matt's got his email on there. Um, if you have any questions specific to any of the information uh, that, that he's got on here, feel, feel free to reach out. Uh, I mean, I, I, this, is, this is fun. This is it's not virgin territory anymore, but it's really, really, really exciting time uh, to be in the industry. And uh, I really appreciate your insights. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, and hope to see you on more webinars.